Over 4,000 years ago, God appeared to Abraham in Mesopotamia and said to him, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee, and I will make of thee a great nation. Abraham obeyed the Lord and came into the promised land of Canaan, where he lived along with his son Isaac and his grandson Jacob, who was later renamed. Israel. Israel and his twelve sons went down into Egypt because of a famine in the land of Canaan. And there they multiplied into a mighty nation. The Egyptians felt threatened by the powerful nation of Israel living among them. So they enslaved them and made their lives bitter with hard bondage. After 430 years in Egypt, they were led out of bondage by Moses, then crossed the Red Sea and went into Arabia where they received the law of God at Mount Sinai. The generation of Israelites that left Egypt with Moses were not allowed to enter the promised land because of their lack of faith in the Lord. They were forced to wander in the wilderness for 40 years until a new generation rose up that trusted the Lord and entered the promised land with Joshua. For about 400 years, the twelve tribes of Israel were ruled by the judges according to the law of Moses. When they desired to have a king like all the other nations, God appointed Saul to be their king, who reigned over them for forty years, followed by King David, who reigned forty years, and David's son Solomon, who reigned forty years. During the reign of Solomon, the kingdom of Israel was at its most glorious, and the first temple was built. But because Solomon's heart turned away from the Lord in his old age, God told him that ten of the tribes would not be ruled by his son. After the death of Solomon, the kingdom of Israel was divided, and the northern ten tribes were ruled over by a series of wicked kings who were not descended from David and Solomon. The northern kingdom retained the name of Israel and eventually had Samaria as its capital city. The smaller southern kingdom became known as Judah, had Jerusalem as its capital, and was reigned over by the descendants of David. Starting in 2 Kings 16, the people of the southern kingdom became known as Jews after the name of the kingdom of Judah. Because of the wickedness of the northern kingdom of Israel, they were overthrown and taken captive by the Assyrians. The Israelites who remained became intermingled with the heathen nations who came in and occupied the land. These people would become known as the Samaritans, and the ten tribes of northern Israel would never be a nation again. The southern kingdom of Judah would eventually be taken captive into Babylon as a punishment for serving other gods, and the temple would be destroyed. But after 70 years, the Jews returned to Judah, rebuilt the temple at Jerusalem, and continued to be ruled by kings descended from David. At the time of Christ, the nation of Judah had become known as Judea and was under Roman rule. Jesus Christ and his disciples preached the gospel throughout Judea, seeking after the lost sheep of the house of Israel. After three and a half years of ministry, the Jews rejected Jesus as their Messiah and convinced the Roman governor to crucify him. Three days later, he rose again from the dead and showed himself alive to his disciples before ascending up to the right hand of the Father in heaven. Shortly before Jesus was crucified, he prophesied that as a punishment for rejecting him, Jerusalem would be burned, the temple would be destroyed, and the Jews would be led away captive into all nations. This prophecy was fulfilled in A.D. 70, when future Roman Emperor Titus conquered Jerusalem. For over 1,800 years, the Jews remained scattered throughout all nations. Then, in 1948, the impossible happened. The state of Israel was founded, and the Jews once again possessed the promised land. Many Christians have proclaimed this to be a miracle and a blessing from God. But was this really the blessing of the Lord? Or were darker forces at work? 
This film has the answer. So in order to understand the founding of the modern state of Israel, you have to understand the history of the Jews from AD 70 until that time. And you have to understand that their religion is no longer based on the Bible whatsoever. For example, ever since the temple was destroyed, they don't do any animal sacrifices. As far as the animal sacrifices are concerned, that's been discontinued. Finished. What developed in Judaism was the system of prayers. It sort of became a substitute. Well, I think that was the beginning of modernization. I really believe that. Once that temple was destroyed, Jews did not have a central location. They were dispersed. They literally changed the nature of Judaism. And that portable form of Judaism led a transformation from priestly Judaism to rabbinic Judaism. Judaism stopped being the religion of the Old Testament and began to be the religion of the rabbis and their traditions, or what they call the oral Torah. The Talmud is the holy book of the Jews. It was the oral sayings of the rabbis. Mm. It's known as the wisdom of the rabbis. The Talmud is a compilation of all the great discussions that took place from the second century BC mm -hmm. until the fifth century CE. It's a kind of encyclopedia right. of Jewish knowledge. The best way of calling it would be the Jewish Wikipedia of the ages. <laughs> yes, because many people participated in it. Right. It's not written by one person. Several hundred hundreds. scholars. Okay. Hundreds of scholars. Hundreds of authors. According to Judaism, the oral law, or what would later be known as the Talmud, was given to the 70 elders that came to the base of Mount Sinai but were not allowed to proceed any further. The Pharisees believed that these 70 elders received a much more extensive and profound revelation than Moses, which was not to be written down. It was only to be passed down orally. And these oral traditions took precedence over the written Torah, or what we know as Genesis through Deuteronomy. Evidence of this is found in the Talmud itself. Ben 21b, my son, be more careful in the observance of the words of the scribes than in the words of the Torah. That's what differentiates the Orthodox from the non-Orthodox. The non-Orthodox sees the Talmud as more man-made. More man-made and developing and so on and so forth. Whereas you believe the Talmud is inspired by God. It's inspired by God, yeah. Everything that has anything to do with scripture is considered the word of God by a large segment of the... Including the Talmud. Yes. He said you don't believe in the religion of Moses. You have for your religion, he told the Jews, you have for your religion the traditions of the elders. In Mark 7, 7, Jesus said of the Pharisees, How be it in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. And the Talmud is the doctrines of men. It's, it's not possible for an ordinary person that's not trained to, to just read the Talmud and understand the oral law. Right. It's very complex. You need a teacher. Has a typical rabbi read it cover to cover? I don't know. It depends what they studied. Have you read it cover to cover? I, I wouldn't say I read all 36 volumes, oh, but okay. I've read several. Right, you've read a lot of it, obviously. Yes, sure. but um, I'm sure people that devote their energies to just study mm -hmm. have done that. Sure. The Jews have always known throughout history that if Christians knew what was in the Talmud, it would make Christians very angry. And so the Jews were able to conceal a lot of their most blasphemous statements about the Lord Jesus Christ because people didn't speak Hebrew. Here's what they say about Jesus in the Talmud. There's sections in there about Jesus. 
In fact, there's an entire book that's been written by the director of Judaic studies in Princeton University, Dr. Schaefer, a Jew. He's written a book, Jesus and the Talmud. So if you want to know what Jesus has to do with the Talmud, get his book, Jesus in the Talmud by Dr. Schaefer. Peter Schaefer is head of the Judaic studies at Princeton University. In his book, Jesus and the Talmud, he documents and analyzes every time Jesus is mentioned in the pages of the Talmud. Keep in mind that the Talmud was written hundreds of years after Christ lived. And so it has references about Jesus in it, and they are hateful, blasphemous references. According to the Talmud, Jesus was the product of adultery, the bastard son of Mary and a Roman soldier named Pantera. He spent his early life in Egypt, where he learned black magic, idolatry, and sorcery. Jesus was born to a whore. Mary was a whore. She had sexual relations with many men. The father was a Roman centurion. The Talmud further blasphemes the Lord Jesus by calling him a fool and comparing him with Old Testament villains such as Balaam, Ahithophel, Doeg, and Gehazi. Does the Talmud talk about the Jews killing Jesus? Or Vaguely, it... but Maimonides believes that the, the Jews killed him, that the Jews executed him because of certain of his doctrines and, and, and so forth. Do you believe that the Jews killed Jesus? Um, it's possible the Jews did kill Jesus. Right. So okay. if, let's say they did. All right? we, maybe he deserved to die. Mm -hmm. Maybe he was a troublemaker. Let's assume we did. Mm -hmm. So we killed somebody. The Talmud actually gloats about Jesus dying young. The passage reads, Hast thou heard how old Balaam was? He replied, Bloody and deceitful men shall not live out half their days. It follows that he was 33 or 34 years old. And you say, wait, that passage says Balaam, not Jesus. But look at the footnote at the bottom of the page. Balaam is frequently used in the Talmud as a type of Jesus. Not only that, but in the Jewish Encyclopedia, volume two, page 469, under Balaam it says, Balaam given to Jesus in Sanhedrin 106b and Gittin 57a. Peter Schaefer states in his book, Jesus in the Talmud, that there can be no doubt that the narrative of the execution in the Talmud refers to Jesus. In fact, the book states, there is no reason to feel ashamed because we rightfully executed a blasphemer and idolater. Jesus deserved death, and he got what he deserved. Elsewhere, the book states, he was a blasphemer and idolater, and although the Romans probably could not care less, we insisted that he get what he deserved. We even convinced the Roman governor, or more precisely, forced him to accept that this heretic and imposter needed to be executed, and we are proud of it. Schaefer said in an article that appeared in Publishers Weekly concerning his new book, I certainly don't want to harm Jewish Christian dialogue, but dialogue requires honesty, and I'm trying to be honest. There are Masonic Jews today who want to take the Talmud and make it Christian. How can you take a, a damnable book and make it Christian? All of these lies about Jesus are right there. The church fathers blame the Jews for the death of Jesus, and that is Paul's doing. It was Paul's doing in the epistle to the Thessalonians, chapter 2. Verse 14 and 15. For ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus. Now, what does that say? This has poisoned the mind of generations of Christians, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Did you know that? So 1 Thessalonians this is 2. Paul. Okay. To this day, 26% of all Americans believe that Jews were responsible in the death of Jesus. When Mel Gibson came out with his The Temptation of Christ, yeah. oh, he's an anti-Semite, what a horrible person. He says the Jews, you know, killed Jesus. Well, that's what the Bible says. The film, uh, the, the, the Passion of the Christ, when it was shown, it went from 26% to 36%, because people are so gullible.
it portrays the Jews as evil people. Oh, okay. Which is nonsense. The Jews call this the myth that the Jews killed Jesus. Let me explain something to you. The fact that the Jews killed Jesus is not a myth. It's Bible. Christians believed it, and they still do today. They still do today. It was ingrained in their mind. They blamed all the Jews, even though most of the Jews were not there. Look at Acts chapter 3, verse 13. It says, The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son Jesus, whom ye delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. So here he's preaching to thousands of Jews. And he says, And now, brethren, I wot that through ignorance ye did it, as did also your rulers. Wait a minute, I thought it was just the rulers. No, he said, you did it, as also did your rulers. That means it wasn't just the rulers, it was the people also. Because if we read the scriptural account, the people are crying out, a mass throng of thousands and thousands of the Jews are crying out, crucify him. And he says, shall I crucify your king? We have no king but Caesar. I am free from the blood of this just person, said the Roman Pilate. His blood be on us and on our children. That's what they said. It states in there that Jesus corrupted Judaism. And as punishment for his crimes, he is now in hell, burning in fiery excrement. And he shall so be forever and ever. They hate Jesus Christ. They hate the name. So I think it's because they are children of the devil, not children of God, and therefore the devil, look at the hatred he has for Christ. So what do you think his children are going to have? 